Just because the Las Vegas Raiders continue to make big mistakes at quarterback doesn't mean that the New Orleans Saints should join in. We got all of that and a little bit of land yet for you on today's episode of Locked on Saints. You are Locked on Saints, your daily New Orleans Saints podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is good, Houdat Nation and Houdat family? Welcome into another episode of Locked on Saints, your daily podcast covering your favorite team, the New Orleans Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks so much as always. Make it Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget you can subscribe and follow for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to continue the conversation with me one-on-one, we can always do so over at joinsubtext.com slash locked on Saints. And as always, I'm your host, Ross Jackson, at Ross Jackson Nola on Twitter, your New Orleans Saints expert, credential member of the media, senior writer and reporter over at Saints News Network, Sports Illustrated Fan Nation site covering the New Orleans Saints. You can also find me every Tuesday on the Locked on NFL podcast and here with you every single Monday through Friday and then some on Locked on Saints. And on today's episode of Locked on Saints, here's what we're going to be doing. We're going to take a look at whether or not the Hunter Renfro trade is loading. We got a couple of days or maybe one more day until really this Trade could potentially start to take some public form unless things have, you know, even if things have already been kind of happening in the background, we'll see if it starts to take public form. We'll also take a look at a couple of other things around that topic, including what the wide receiver depth chart would look like if Hunter Renfro was added. We'll also take a look at Alante Taylor and sort of the differences that he's experienced in the slot. We'll break that down. But the first thing that I want to highlight here is a big talking point conversation that has been going on. And let me be very clear to start this off the New Orleans Saints who have been historically injury prone over the course of the past couple of years with no exceptions in in regards to position or anything like that should be in absolutely no hurry to trade Jameis Winston no matter what big mistakes Las Vegas Raiders continue to make. Now, what do I mean by big mistakes Las Vegas Raiders continue to make? If you're somebody that listens to me not only here on Locked on Saints as an everydayer, but if you catch me over in the Locked on NFL podcast as well with Luke Braun, you'll know that I am somebody that was very, very, very down on the idea that the Raiders should pursue Jimmy Garoppolo. I thought that they should go all out and do everything that they could to keep Tom Brady in the league as opposed to as an owner or part owner or whatever and all those other things, and that they should leave Jimmy Garoppolo alone, let him hang out in San Francisco, be a backup, all that other stuff, or bring him in to be a backup. But They paid him way too much money uh, for that. So when I look at the Raiders' decision to bring in Jimmy Garoppolo, and actually, if you're an everydayer here on Locked on Saints, then you know as well that when we were at the Combine, the whispers were, the very loud whispers were, the New Orleans Saints want Derek Carr, and if they can't get Derek Carr, that their backup plan is Jimmy Garoppolo. So I was out here like, please get Derek Carr, (laughs) because Jimmy Garoppolo isn't going to be able to be healthy and isn't going to be able to be on the field for you. And we learned that just a couple of months ago, he had another surgery, which could potentially uh, have a long-term impact or whatever, and is impacting what the Las Vegas Raiders need to do at the quarterback position to begin the year. So because of that, there's been a lot of different sort of question marks and rumors that have come about, about whether or not the New Orleans Saints should consider trading uh, Jameis Winston to the Las Vegas Raiders. Logistically, it can work. Jameis Winston took an amended deal to stick around here in New Orleans, only $4 million of which are guaranteed. And so with all of that, and I think, uh, yeah, $2.8 million of it were, were a signing bonus, but it's a, it's a four-year, I mean, it's a one-year $4 million deal. So at most, if you trade him away, you're taking on effectively a $4 million cap hit. And that's not terrible, especially at the quarterback position. So logistically, from the contract sense, can it work? Yeah. Um, the thing that you have to also be concerned about is what's going to be the return is Hunter Ren- would Hunter Renfro be a part of that return? Because it feels like if you're trading to get a guy like Jameis Winston, that having a guy like Hunter Renfro can be a shorthanded over the middle type guy can be a big deal for a guy like Jameis Winston and for the Las Vegas Raiders. And so you would have to also be able to get a package back that makes sense, all of that. But the additional piece on top of this is that the Saints probably just shouldn't even entertain this to begin with. If they want to go after Hunter Renfro, do it with draft picks, maybe other assets, things like that. But I don't know that Jameis Winston needs to be the guy that you end up sending off somewhere. And look, he's still talking about getting healthy. He's still talking about getting back to being out on the field and all these other things. So what does that mean for his value in trade conversations when he's saying that and other NFL teams are hearing that? 
all of that. But the bottom line here is that when I spoke with Joel Thomas, who's the Saints running backs coach uh, yesterday, Tuesday at OTAs, one of the things that he mentioned, or one of the questions that I asked him was, what do you think of the idea of having too many mouths to feed in the backfield? Because it feels like running back is a spot where we used to say that a bunch. We don't say it as much anymore. But wide receiver, a pass catcher now is a spot where everybody's like, oh, no, too many mouths to feed. Um, And Joel Thomas kind of laughed that off and was like, no, there's no such thing because you're two plays away from being down to your third guy. If I take that same logic and I apply it to the quarterback position, as much of an Ironman as Derek Carr has been, the reality throughout his career, the reality is that even for the remainder of a single game or something like that, you're only one play away from turning things over to a quarterback that has already started in your uh, system, that has won in your system, and that has the respect and chemistry and, uh, and, and familiarity with the players around the locker room, and that will be on the field. That's a big deal for the Saints here in 2023, where they're trying to compete. Let's say something happens and Derek Carr has to miss the fourth quarter of a game and the Saints are holding, let's just say, a 10-point lead. If you want to maintain that lead or perhaps extend that lead, you're going to run the ball a ton, don't get me wrong, but you might need to be ready to throw yourselves back into it or distance yourself at a critical point when the opportunity becomes available. And if you're going to trust the guy to do that, it's probably not the rookie, it's probably the veteran that's been in your system for the past few years. You're one play away from having to do that. And a lot of times the New Orleans Saints, year after year after year, have been one win away from getting into the playoffs to the point where they're having to sit back and watch and wait and see if somebody else wins before they get their opportunity. That half game, that fourth quarter can make all the difference for you if that game happens in, let's say, October, when you're watching the games again in January heading into uh, heading into the playoffs. So I just think that with the mentality that the New Orleans Saints have had so far this offseason, Knowing that one coach's mentality, at least, is that you're only two plays away from being down to your third guy, understanding sort of the synergistic nature of the New Orleans Saints coaching staff, it wouldn't surprise me if they feel the same way about the quarterback spot as well. And unless you're going to throw Ronald Curry out there, I don't know, you're going to be in trouble if you, if you end up doing something like this, or can be in trouble if you end up doing something like this. So unless the return is... A situation to where it's a, you know, it's not going to be a godfather offer, but if it's an offer to where you look at it and you say, okay, we can't say no to that. If it's a, a day two pick or if it's, you know, a, a day, an early day three pick, but a premier player or something like that. And I don't consider that to be the Hunter Renfro piece. I consider Hunter Renfro to be a very important role player, but I don't consider him to be a playmaker, a game changer, that, that type of, that type of player. Like we've been talking about Rashid Shahid over the course of the past couple of days. And so, The way that I look at it when it comes to Jameis Winston, your team is far too injury prone, at least for now, for you to expect that that's just going to turn off over the course of an offseason. The Pelicans are revamping their entire player care personnel. Could the New Orleans Saints be looking to do the same if they see if they see the benefits from the Pelicans, but still struggle with injuries in 2023? There's still so many question marks around all that, that it just doesn't make sense for the New Orleans Saints to set themselves up in a situation to where they don't have the appropriate backup, where they feel like they have the best quarterback room in the NFL right now. They feel that way. Why damage that by trading away Jameis Winston? It doesn't make sense unless the return is something that you absolutely cannot say no to. Coming up next, we're going to take a look at Alante Taylor. We're going to break down sort of the transition from outside corner to nickel corner why it's not a full position change for him, and what are some of the things that he's learning, and who are some of the players that he's turning to. We're going to get to all that as we continue on with today's episode of Locked on Saints, part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode of Locked on Saints brought to you by Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the market. If you head over to Built.com right now, it's emblazoned all over the website. Coconut brownie puff bars are back. You get those flakes of coconut, you get the brownie that everybody loves. You get the puff, which is the mar- the protein-infused marshmallow, all covered in 100% chocolate. It simply doesn't get any better than that. There's also now the limited edition, very vanilla puff and bar. So if you're a, a vanilla fan like me, you can find that in both the pr- protein-infused marshmallow type as well as the standard built bar type. Again, all covered in 100% dark chocolate. So make sure you go and check them out today. You can find them at built.com. But if you're near a Walmart, you can head over to the pharmacy section, get a four-bar box of some hit flavors there. And if you're near a Sam's Club, 13-bar box of churro puff 
and brownie batter puff, two of their hit flavors as well. So once again, that is Walmart, Built.com, as well as Sam's Club to get your Built Bars today. All right, family, continuing on with today's episode of Locked on Saints. Appreciate you as always. Make it Locked on Saints your first listen of the day every day to all the everydayers out there. So I want to take a look now at Alante Taylor. Alante Taylor getting some work in the slot over on the defensive side. I mean, look, he has the energy, he has the tenacity, he has the attacking mentality to look natural there, but it's going to be a learning curve for him. And I want to be very clear that this is not a full position change. Last night in our live episode, we spoke about in tandem Kirk Merritt's position change, uh, or what we're expecting to be his position change, uh, as well as Alante Taylor getting some work in the slot. Those are two different conversations right now. Kirk Merritt has spent his entire offseason and OTAs with the running backs. That feels like a position change, if not already done, is on the way. Whereas with Alante Taylor, it feels a lot much, it feels a lot more like he's just getting those opportunities in the slot to kind of cross train there, but he is still an outside corner. In fact, he went so far as to say that himself. He didn't say anything about transitioning positions, changing positions, anything like that. All that he said was, yeah, I'm getting some work in the slot. And then he basically stopped everybody for a moment. And he was like, and like, I'm still an outside corner. Like, I'm happy to learn the position. I'm learning a lot from all the folks around me. I'm making a lot of mistakes, but I'm still an outside corner. I mean, look, this is a guy that has I'm him tattooed behind his uh, behind his ear. This is a guy that has that plays with incredible intensity, incredible speed, uh, remarkable uh, in terms of his confidence in himself and just changes number to number one. Now, there's a deeper meaning to what the number one means, but everything about Alante presents as an alpha corner. Uh, forgive me for using the alpha trope, but, you know, it, it, it's very much a I'm here and I'm not going anywhere type of guy like that's who Alante Taylor is. He belongs anywhere he goes and that can be in the slot. He would belong in the slot if you if if that's what the, the Saints decided to do with him. But he just as much belongs on the outside. So this continues the conversation for the New Orleans Saints, right? Like, who's the guy on the outside? Is it Paul Sandibo? Is it Alante Taylor? Now, Paul Sandibo was not present Tuesday at the fourth session of OTAs to kick off the second week. We'll see how that changes going into next week, but that could be a big door open for guys like Alante Taylor, as well as even Troy Pride Jr., who had an interception in uh, Tuesday's practice while guarding Juwan Johnson, which was pretty dope. So I think that when you look at where Alante Taylor is, it's really just about cross-training. It's not about a suggested position change or anything like that, a la what we're seeing with Kirk Merritt. So what are some of the things that he's learning? What are some of the nuances of playing on the inside versus playing on the outside? Well, one of the things that he highlighted was knowing where your help is. That's a big one when you're playing in uh, when you're playing in the slot because you actually have a lot more help. You have the overhang linebackers. You have the linebackers that are shading towards the inside. Sometimes you even have defensive linemen dropping in the coverage. You have the outside corner and you have the safety. If you're the outside corner, sometimes you're on an island, right? Depending upon what the safety's responsibility is, you're on an island by yourself. You might not have any help at all. And at best, you have one safety. <laughs> yeah, I was about to say you have one safety blanket, but you've got one safety. And that's in a split, you know, uh, uh, safety situation to where one safety is covering one half the field, yours and the other safety is covering the other half of the field, your CB2 or your CB1 on the opposite side. And so it's a very different game playing on the inside. It's also a lot more congestion, having to be able to move through traffic, track players throughout traffic. It gets really, really tough for any defensive player to track a an, an offensive route runner that's going from one side of the field to the other side of the field. So that's crossing the side of the field laterally. That's very tough because you're always kind of stuck playing behind that wide receiver in that case. Not a lot that you can do about it. When you're in the slot, it gets even tougher because you're having to fight through defensive linemen getting pushed upfield. You're having to fight through linebackers collapsing down on a play action. You're having to fight through other players that are also making those crosses and your own corners and safeties playing down in the box and all that. And so it's a it's a tricky, tricky, tricky position to master and to learn. One of the things that made TJ Garner Johnson so good there is just with his ability to be able to navigate all of that. He navigated all of that with such a precision while also maintaining like this sticky coverage over the top of these route runners, whether they be slot receivers or whether they be tight ends. So that's a big part of what Alante's having to learn here is where's your help? How and, and I didn't get a chance to ask him about this, but I'm certain, certain that your run fits, your run responsibilities, all different in the slot as opposed to on the outside as a perimeter corner. In the slot, you kind of become maybe let's call it a secondary as opposed to a tertiary 
you probably become like a secondary run, your run stopping source with your primary run stopping source being your front seven or front six, depending upon how you're, um, you know, what, what type of position you're in and all that. But that means that you then become a part of the front seven as the most interior player at corner while your safeties are over the top, while your outside corners are on the outside, it does make things a little bit more tricky for you because it's almost like you have to play run first and then commit to the coverage. Whereas with corners on the outside, you kind of just get to commit to the coverage. So uh, I, I think all of those things show you where, you know, the leap has to be made. It's not just as simple as take a player that's never done it before, plug them in the slot and they'll be fine. And let's not get it twisted. Alante Taylor has not been play, has not been asked to play in the slot very much at all. You can look back at his Tennessee days. You can look back at his first year here in New Orleans. There were some times where he did take snaps in the slot. A lot of those times were because he was motioned into the slot or, you know, because he was playing man coverage or the couple of occasions in which he did line up on the inside on a specific receiver or a specific pass catching talent or something like that. And I think that that's what Alante Taylor stands to gain here. It's not that if he you know, cross trains in the nickel, but then doesn't become a nickel corner that this was all a failure. I think the biggest thing that he can take away from all this is that if he can it can get comfortable in the slot and play from the slot, be, be impactful from the slot, then he becomes the guy that you can say, okay, wherever that receiver is that they want the Saint, that the Saints want Taylor to line up on, that he could just shadow that receiver. Because if that receiver plays in the slot, he's, he's got what he needs to be able to do that. If he plays on the outside, he's got what he needs to be able to do that. So I think that, that becomes the biggest thing. This is still very valuable knowledge. A, it gives him a greater holistic understanding of everyone's responsibilities on the defensive side so he knows what that, that slot corner's job is when it is Bradley Roby or potentially Paul Sadebo or a Smoke Monday or an Ugo Amadi or Alani Johnson, whomever's going to be there. Um, but also gives him the opportunity for the Saints to be able to say, go shut this wide receiver down. And wherever that wide receiver lines up, Alante Taylor should be ready to shadow, trail, follow. That's the big benefit here to cross training him in the slot. Coming up next, is Hunter Renfro season loading here in New Orleans? We're just a couple days away from the June 1st, June 2nd actual transaction period, but the June 1st uh, kind of contract date. We'll explain the significance of that, what it could mean for the New Orleans Saints when it comes to Hunter Renfro. And if Hunter Renfro hits the roster, how many wide receivers do the Saints take into 2023? We got that, all that coming up for you as we continue on and wrap up today's episode of Locked On Saints, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Let's get it, Houdat Nation. Wrapping up today's episode of Locked On Saints with a look at Hunter Renfro, which is going to be effectively the wide receiver position being the focus to end the show here today. Uh, coming up later on today, we will be live on the Locked On Saints podcast. We'll just continue to go through more notes from OTAs, who lined up where. We'll take a look at some more of the the absences and things like that. And then we'll kind of go more in depth on the seven on seven drills and a little bit of team drills that we got to see. So we're just going to break down a little bit more of the practice and then all throughout the week, we'll be sharing some more sound from the interviews and all that good stuff as well. Um, <clears throat> so getting started with this tonight, the, the thing that I want to kind of focus on is, is Hunter Renfro to start. Um, June one becomes a, a big time day for the Hunter Renfro of it all when it comes to, to the NFL. There's no reason to expect that Hunter Renfro is only in the eyes of the New Orleans Saints. He has to be in the eyes of several other uh, uh, you know, teams out there as well. And that's assuming that he gets traded at all, right? We have to see if that even happens in the first place. But the big thing to, to keep in mind here is that June 1 is the important date. Why? June 1 becomes that sort of contract cutoff date in which uh, if you trade away a player or you cut a player, you transact a player in some way, uh, all of the dead money that remains on the contract for that player ends up swooping into that year. And so you end up taking on some dead cap, you end up, or, or you end up in a situation to where you're not able to truly capitalize on the amount of cash you could be saving and all those other things. So the Raiders are now in a situation as June 1 clears and we get into June 2nd. That's why I'm saying June 1 as the, the transaction date because it's post June 1. So it's June 2nd when the, when the transaction date would have to happen at the absolute earliest. This ends up being about a five, six million dollar difference for the Las Vegas Raiders, who could be in a situation where they're looking for a new quarterback uh, to, to get a hold of or sign or, or whatever. Not that there's a lot of options out there at this point. But so that five, six million dollars can absolutely move the needle for them. So basically what happens is that the Raiders right now, 
uh, have a $6.5 million base salary that goes to uh, Hunter Renfro. There's a guaranteed amount of $10.8 million, and that's because of a $4.3 million roster bonus that got added. There's some prorated bonuses from a restructure beforehand, all these other things, or a signing bonus beforehand, all these other things, workout bonuses, per game roster bonuses, all that. So if the Raiders were to cut him right now, they would end up taking all or, or only saving about $5.7 million. But if they were to wait until June 2nd and trade him June 2nd or later, then they save $11.3 million against this year's salary cap. That's huge mongous for them. Uh, and, and it's massively helpful. They also get an additional like $3 million for next year. All that uh, they go from uh, getting no cap savings moving on from him in 2025 to getting about a million dollars, about $2 million in 2025. So there's a lot of, of, of pieces there that end up, up helping you uh, a, a ton. Now, you're not going to get all of those things that just scales down depending upon which year you end up trading them. So it's $11.3 million or nothing, basically. So the, that's, the, that's the big difference there is that there's about a $5 million difference, a little more than a $5 million difference in between holding on to them and eventually trading them. So the way that that works in the favor of the New Orleans Saints is that they have Derek Carr on the roster. They've got players that Hunter Renfro and the Las Vegas Raiders are familiar with. And it's ultimately going to come down to the decision where Hunter Renfro goes. It's not going to come down to Hunter Renfro's decision. It's going to come down to the Raiders' decision in terms of who's going to give them the most for the player. So the Raiders, don't expect the Raiders to look back and go, oh, well, you know, Derek Carr is over there and Brian Edwards is over there and Foss Moreau is over there and they're all good friends of Hunter Renfro. So we're just going to trade Hunter Renfro to the New Orleans Saints because mm, his friends are there. That's just not how that's going to work, right? Like that's not going to be the situation. The Raiders are going to make the choice based upon who offers them the most if they even trade him away at all, which again, with their, re with their quarterback concerns, it could go one way or another. Do you feel like you need Hunter Renfro to be able to help your quarterback? Or do you feel like your season is just kind of a wash because you made a bad decision at quarterback again? And so let's just get Hunter Renfro somewhere where he can he can continue to play and and potentially win a Super Bowl. So there's there's kind of all of those other little little nuances and pieces to it as well. The next thing is that if he does land here in New Orleans, which I would say that something like a fourth, fifth round pick would be able to get that done. I don't think it takes much. And so, especially with compensatory picks on the way and, and all those, that's a weird emphasis, compensatory picks on the way and all those other things for 2024. Yeah. I mean, you can trade a day three selection, no problem. And I th I've been, I've been calling for the saints to trade day three picks and day three draft selections for proven and established veterans for years. And so this would be a nice step in that direction. Although, you know, the saints had a pretty good day three haul in, in this year's draft class. So what do I know? Um, the next piece of it is what, who makes the roster? If, if you're on the, if you're the New Orleans Saints and you have the Saints trading for Hunter Renfro, adding him to what is already a very stacked wide receiver position, uh, wide receiver room, which includes two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 different players, Rashid Shahid, Malik Flowers, both kind of have that wide receiver return specialist overlap. James Washington, he was not present uh, at, on Tuesday, but then you've also got Michael Thomas, Trey Quan Smith, who also wasn't present, uh, also weren't present. Uh, A.T. Perry, Chris Olave, Kirk Merritt, Keith Kirkwood, Brian Edwards, Shaq Davis, and then of course Kawan Baker. So I think that like your locks on the roster at this point are of course guys like Michael Thomas, Chris Olave, Rashid Shahid. So at most you've got probably three spots, maybe maybe four more, maybe four more. But that would be unusual for New Orleans. New Orleans usually doesn't come into the season with seven wide receivers. Uh, a guy like Malik Flowers, you can get to your practice squads. There wouldn't be a ton of rush there. James Washington gives you another deep threat type, while Brian Edwards gives you another big body type. And so the two of them make a ton of sense, but A.T. Perry's in that equation as well. And so if A.T. Perry versus Brian Edwards becomes a battle, I would have to say that Brian Edwards is currently ahead in that battle. But if that's not a battle, and those are the six players that make it, let's say Chris Olave, Michael Thomas, Rashid Shahid, James Washington, A.T. Perry, and Kirk Merritt, and you get a guy like Keith Kirkwood to be the leader over, or not Kirk Merritt, I'm sorry, Brian Edwards, you get a guy like Keith Kirkwood to be a leader over on the, uh, over on the um, uh, practice squad and all that. And actually, I, I should hedge, I, I, should, I should adjust one thing, Kirk Merritt 
running with the running backs, not a not the wide receivers. So maybe he's not actually a part of this wide receiver conversation at the time. But if that's the case, then you've got guys like Shaq Davis, you've got guys like Kawan Butler or Kawan uh, Baker that aren't making the roster in that case, which wouldn't be a massive surprise because Kawan Baker has not made the roster before. Shaq Davis is an undrafted free agent and as impressive as he might be. If he can't contribute on special teams, it's it's Emmanuel Butler all over again, right? It's like that type of a situation all over again. Um, and then Traquan Smith has to be a part of the conversation, at least just as somebody that has been on the team um, and, and made the roster so far. So I think that if you look at all that, then your conversation becomes either James Washington or Hunter Renfro or Brian Edwards or Hunter Renfro or A.T. Perry or Hunter Renfro. So you're looking at maybe one of those last three or you keep seven. You just keep seven. And, and, and that allows you to be able to do what you, you know, need to do in terms of wide receiver and going out and getting a Hunter Renfro and, and all that. But it, it is a tricky situation. Um, this is a situation to where I wouldn't say that there's too many mouths to feed, but I will say that there's a lot of talent and not a lot of roster spots. And so Hunter Renfro becomes a lock if you trade for him. There's no doubt about that. So your top four become guys like Michael Thomas, Chris Olave, Rashid Shahid, Hunter Renfro. Then you just have to figure out who the other two are. And I think right now the tightest three are guys like James Washington, um, Brian Edwards, as well as uh, A.T. Perry. But nothing is guaranteed to any of those players either. So it could be, could be tricky. could be tricky. If I was making my vote, uh, it would probably be those four at the top, and then it would be um, A.T. Perry and Brian Edwards. I want the big guys. I want the big guys. I've got the, the speed guys, and I can get Malik Flowers to the practice squad. I can get Keith Kirkwood to the practice squad. I can get some of that talent to the practice squad, and maybe Kirk Merritt either makes the roster as a running back, which gives you versatility at wide receiver, kind of Ty Montgomery-like, or he may, hits the practice squad, and then he's two for one in terms of that practice squad spot. So that's the way that I would look at it. If I'm the New Orleans Saints, let me know how you feel. If the Saints were to trade for Hunter Renfro, which six wide receivers, make it challenging on yourself, which six wide receivers would you keep in New Orleans? Coming up later on today, we'll go live. We're talking um, we're talking uh, positional breakout for uh, OTAs, how drills went and all that stuff, as well as attendance. So we'll get to all of that in tonight's episode. I uh, want to shout out Kenneth Walker for the question about Hunter Renfro, who which kind of led to all this. And I want to give a big happy birthday to Nate Lyon, one of the most loyal everydayers here uh, that is here on the chat, that is here sending questions, that is listening to every show. Uh, so happy birthday, not only for me, but happy birthday from Haley as well, because she took the time to make this happen. She reached out and she said, hey, I would love for you to say happy birthday uh, to Nate on the show. And so it, that that's an easy yes for me. And, and so happy for the both of you. So happy for you and happy birthday. Thank you so much as always, y'all for coming through for another episode of Locked on Saints. Make me part of your day, part of your routine for saying yes to me and the show. As always, if you see me, say hi. And if you want to keep the conversation going, just head over to subtext.com slash locked. Oh, sorry, join subtext.com slash locked on Saints. Otherwise, though, between these episodes, you need anything around your New Orleans Saints, make sure you follow me on Twitter at Ross Jackson, N-O-L-A. Hit me up. Let me know how the family's doing. Let me know how you're living. Let me know how your mom and them. And trust you, that nation, I'll holla at you.